But first up, Nicola Willis. Good afternoon, Nicola. Good, good afternoon, Tina. How are you? I'm very good on this beautiful day in Wellington. It is a beautiful day in Wellington, and I'm looking forward to going down and meeting with some of those groundswell protesters later on. I think it's time that some of us in Wellington remembered that farmers help pay the bills in this country, <laughs> uh, and we ignore them at our peril. Yeah, they do. And I, th I think one of the interesting things about the groundswell movement is it's finally sort of found its, its place. Uh, it was sort of hijacked a bit there for a while and they were a bit loose and wild, but boy, by crikey, in this last wee while, I've become a very professional, targeted organisation that I do really think represents a large group of farmers in this country. Yeah, and look, I think any protest movement has uh, a, a big tent of people under it. You know, no protest movement can control everyone in it. There'll be a range of views within it. But there is clearly a movement across the country from farmers saying, look, we have had enough with the barrage, the tidal wave of regulation and cost that this government's imposing on us. We can't take it anymore. And when a government's got to the point that it says, look, we're quite happy to promote a policy in which one in five of our sheep and beef farms would no longer be profitable... Well, look, that's, that's really, that's at the extreme end of things. So it is time for farmers to speak up and good on uh, the protest movement for making that happen. Yeah, and interestingly, this time I think they're, they're more than backed by federated farmers. Um, we've seen Andrew Hogarth came out quite strongly around this. Uh, and now we've also seen dairy, and uh, uh, there's a dairy uh, lobby group, was a Dairy NZ, come out just <laughs> in the last few days. And, and, and it was a very sort of, um, I would call it sort of like a, a very gentlemanly um, shove at the government over the reforms as well. The, these groups are not known for taking the government on. They much prefer to actually work with them. So uh, for them to come mm. out quite strongly and criticise is a very big change in uh, the farming group lobby uh, and how they're seeing these reforms and they are definitely saying no. But hey, look, um, I know your time is, uh, is tight today because the House is sitting and no doubt it'll be a very interesting session, I would suspect. Um, mm. and, and and, we've, and I picked up your speech on social investment speech and I urge everyone who's listening this afternoon um, to jump on board the National Party uh, website and, and get a copy of the speech. It's one of those speeches that I think sets a tone for what we can do right in the future to give everyone a better life. I have to mm. uh, also say that I've got a little bit of... Um, prior background knowledge of this because I work with Paula Rebstock on the mm. um, welfare w um, reforms uh, way back nearly 10 years ago uh, and so I, I understand some of the uh, of the reasoning and the principal positions behind this but if you can just take us through uh, what the social investment model is and what you're expecting to achieve with it. Yeah well social investment is about targeting earlier intervention using data and evidence to change people's lives for the better, but doing that with evaluation and feedback so that if it's not working, you stop it. And what it is a response to is the fact that for successive governments, billions of dollars get spent on well-intended programs and projects but a lot of the time, we don't really see good results. And I, and I get that sense across the country. People are frustrated because they look at this government spending a lot of money, but then all the problems continue. You know, we've got the kids doing the ram raids, we've got the growing truancy. And they don't measure kids. anything they either, don't, do they, Nicola? And they don't, and they don't, they don't never set a target. No one's ever held accountable. The bureaucracy gets bigger and nothing happens. So how do we change that? And today what we have actually at our disposal is great data, best data we've ever had. We've got this thing called the integrated data uh, set and what it does is it looks at all of the things that we're doing as a government and you can work out from that what's working and what's not. We also have the ability uh, to evaluate what's working. And what Paula Rebstock did, as you know, was she went in and she said, well, what, you know, what would happen uh, if we actually did get some of these people off welfare into work? What would that mean in terms of the saving to the taxpayer and the change in their life. And when you account for how much it costs the taxpayer, if someone is dependent on the state, that is worth so much money. And if you actually took that money and you invested it up front, 
and you stopped them being dependent on the state, not only would that change their lives, but actually it would save the taxpayer money. So, you know, a good example of this uh, social investment approach is the Healthy Homes Initiative. Now, the last national government did something that's pretty unfashionable under Labor. They set themselves a clear target, which was to reduce the incidence of, sort of rheumatic fever among children. They said, well, let's see, uh, if, and actually, if we made their homes healthier, if we insulated them, uh, if we made them dry and warmed them up, whether that would reduce the incidence. They invested in a careful pilot. The evidence was clear. The savings from lower hospitalisation, uh, lower GP visits, uh, kids attending school more, made that project pay off at a ratio of three to one. So for every dollar they invested, they saved $3 down the track. I want to do more of that stuff. And so that's the, uh, that is actually probably the only one I can think of in this government's time that has actually been measured and actually has had a positive outcome. Is there any others? Well, so that one, yeah, you're right, Tina. Cause, and isn't it ironic that the one thing that they can point to and measure was something started by National. And what National did differently with that program and what I want to do with new programs uh, when we are leading the government is right from the beginning, they put in data and evaluation in a feedback loop. So right from the beginning, ministers were holding themselves accountable for exposing whether or not that failed or did well. And they set it up with that system in there. And that meant that, you know, Jacinda Ardern recently was able to update on its success. Most programs that Labor run have no targets there's no accountability. It's just a soup of good intention. That's and a really good, good way of putting it. Not enough. Now, one of the yeah. things that I did want to tease out a wee bit was because uh, I think one of the things that we are getting increasingly concerned about as a nation is the whole uh, ethos around giving up our freedoms and, in some respects, our, our data. Uh, and so mm. I, I, I certainly understand and uh, applaud the moves around uh, integrated data infrastructure being used as a fundamental uh, tool to drive the knowledge base on which to make good policy decisions. But how are we going to be assured that this data is not going to be misused? That's a really good point, Tina, and it's something that's um, important to me and that I um, dwelt on in my speech yesterday. Because when we are using the data in that set, we have to make sure that no one can be identified individually and that it's anonymous. And when we're using that data, we have to have the highest standards of privacy protection and of ethical use. And that's why it can't just be open slather. You can't just let anyone anywhere whenever they want access that database. It is too precious. So uh, I want to have in place very strict rules for its use so that privacy can be protected. And that means actually working alongside the Privacy Commissioner and others to ensure that they are happy with the way that data is being used. But, you know, I, I wouldn't even go down the path if I didn't think there was such a great prize at the end of it. Because if we use that data well, so much is possible. And, and, you know, when we, when we find out what are the things that actually keep a kid out of prison and on the straight and narrow... What are the things that make sure a child actually finishes their qualification at school? When we learn that stuff, we can change people's lives. So I, I totally don't agree want that data that. wasted. No. Now, the, set, the third part of this is the actual um, social investment bond, which I think is causing a lot of conversations out there, as to how do you fund <laughs> this stuff? And I really like that idea of people who have got some uh, extra spondies uh, to invest in a fund which can then be used to shape up some interventions based on the knowledge that you get from the IDI. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how you think that can work? Has it worked anywhere else in, in the world? Yeah, look, there's a couple of aspects to this. I, I, I um, want to create a social investment fund. And as a starting place, I think, uh, as a government, we in every budget will put money into that fund. So we'll start from there. But when that fund is commissioning work, there's two things. One, I want them to be actively working with non-government organisations. Because when I look around the country... Hallelujah. The people doing the most, <laughs> yeah, the people doing the most extraordinary work. Who are exactly. they? It's Mike mm. King. He's the one picking up the broken pieces in our mental health system that the government's failed to do. It's Julie Chapman. 
whose Kids Can program is actually getting food to kids in schools. It's, it's people like David Latelli running that magnificent food bank and helping people with health issues. So I think those people are often 10 times as effective as a well-meaning public servant chain to a And the passion. They come with the passion. That's the other thing I think people miss in that they equation. They are so invested. So let's get them involved and have them working alongside us. And then the second bit of it is, if, by good grace, if, because we're doing such a good job, people like that and philanthropists and charities say, look, we want to help you expand a particular program that you're running or we think this is great and we want more of it happening for more kids and we're prepared to invest in it. Am I going to say no to their money, Tina? No. Absolutely not. I'm not going to let ideology get in the way of good results. There's some really interesting stuff happening in this space too. You've got people like Sam Johnson uh, who has just setting up a, 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 a... uh, an organisation or has become part of an organisation. I think it's called SIL or SAL or something. Um, and I've been trying to get hold of him to find out more about it. But it is all around the social investment and new ways of doing things. And then we also mm. have people like Marcus Daniels, um, for, who hails from the Wairarapa. Uh, and mm. he, he also is, is saying, if you're going to give, you've got to give with effect. And, and I, yeah. I, I, the, you can sort of see the stars aligning here because um, it would mm. be fair to say that neither Marcus nor... Um, uh, Sam come from sort of, they're not woke by any stretch, stretch of the imagination, but they have this ethos of making sure that uh, anything that you do is effective. And that's, that's s- right. essentially what you're doing with the social investment model. Yeah, um, it's just about saying if we're going to do things, it's not enough to say, look, we've got really good intentions and we, we're really hopeful. Actually got to make the result happen. I went to an event last night uh, with Philanthropy New Zealand Uh, And they're increasingly working uh, with a new organisation called Impact Lab. And Impact Lab uh, measures what social uh, benefits are created by charities and non-government organisations. And they do that because on the one hand, the charities want to know, well, are we actually achieving what we set out to achieve? But also because when people donate their money, they want to know it's actually getting the effects that they want. So all of this is, I think, just about being sensible and practical and just realising that signing big cheques and hoping isn't enough. We need more rigour, we need to be far more accountable and we need to stop hosing money away. I totally agree, with that, Nicola. And look, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And again, I urge everyone to uh, have a read of uh, Nash, uh, of Nicola's speech on the National Party website. Or have, is it? Are you going to podcast it uh, as well, Nicola? That's a good idea, Tina. I should do um, a podcast. There's a, a link to my lecture on my Facebook page, Excellent. Nicola Willis MP, if people want to watch it. Um, I appreciate that public policy, which is really what this is, can be boring, but this is the stuff that makes a good government. When we get this stuff a, working well, we get results. It's a bloody good read, and, and, and I'm sure that if you do a podcast, people will take notice. And thank you very much again for your time, Nicola, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Tina. Have a great afternoon.